Hello, everyone. My name is Rue Benajar. Uh, I am the product manager for gene editing and molecular biology at Genscript, and I'm really excited to be sharing with you a new product. Over the last 20 years, Genscript has expanded our uh, global footprint fairly drastically. We started in uh, 2002 in New Jersey. And um, as you can see, um, since then, uh, we have um, grown significantly by um, by growing the actual company and of course by acquisitions. And in late 2020, we uh, developed and worked on a DNA encoded chemical library kit uh, that we are naming Gendical. So the Gendical kit is based off of the DNA encoded chemical library technology, which is a combinatorial chemistry that consists of uh, uh, combining chemical compounds, small chemical compounds uh, to DNA barcodes. And by doing so, uh, we, we have been able to pull these chemical compounds in a single test tube, uh, which of course is very beneficial uh, for people that are working with a uh, protein of interest and they want to identify a target um, that would interact with their protein of interest. So um, by doing so, uh, instead of having to do a unique spatial grid for individual chemical compounds, um, the screening can actually take place in a single test tube. And of course, that's 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 leveraged by using the DNA barcode. Once the hits are identified uh, at the end of the screen, you do your NGS sequencing and you can identify the chemical compound that bound to your protein of interest using the DNA barcode sequence. So in a typical um, library screening, uh, I actually found a Nature article that I thought would be interesting for, for this presentation, uh, and it's cited up here. Uh, and basically what the, what the article spoke about is that in a conventional high throughput screening, on average, a chemical compound costs about uh, $1,100 per compound. And, and when you're typically working with this kind of um, technology, you're interested in screening um, approximately a million compound, uh, probably um, upwards of a million, at least a couple million. And so it ends up costing, with those numbers uh, in mind, it ends up costing between 400 million to $2 billion um, for just uh, an initial screen. So by using a DNA encoded library technology, you're potentially screening millions of compounds at the same time. And so that cost is typically upfront where you're developing that technology. And so um, the actual article estimated it for, um, for a conventional DNA encoded library technology screening, approximately $150,000 to develop it. Uh, so it brings down the cost of, um, of every compound to less than two cents. Uh, however, if you were to use an off the shelf uh, kit such as the Genscript solution, that $150,000 is reduced even further. So this is where the Genscript technology uh, comes into play and it enables um, uh, the additional time that you would do for synthesizing the compounds and uh, trying to develop the kit um, kind of um, a ready solution where you don't have to do that additional step. So to the right hand side, uh, I actually uh, included a screenshot of a a system um, uh, that basically had uh, 15, uh, 1536 plates where uh, each individual compound is typically um, um, used to screen uh, the protein. So instead of pulling all the compounds together, you're having to screen each individual compound separately and you have to separate them on a spatial grid. So each plate can hold in this specific scenario can hold uh, 15, uh, 1,000, 15, sorry, 15, uh, 36 compounds. Uh, and of course you need several of those to be able to conduct your million protocol screen. And of course that becomes very expensive because of course you need a lot of protein as well. So very quickly it becomes very, very complex and very expensive. So uh, I have a quick quote from um, Richard, Richard Leary, which uh, he's um, actually one of the, uh, people that developed this technology was one of the inventors and what he said is that DNA encoded libraries now make it possible for academics to access compounds that pharmaceutical companies struggled to develop for many years. And so um, not only has it saved uh, a tremendous amount of money for pharmaceutical companies, it has enabled academic institutions where um, this technology uh, or, pharma or drug development would have been uh, 
unachievable, but now it is with this technology. So over the past several years, um, I just did a quick uh, screenshot of all the different um, uh, companies. Uh, of course, a lot of pharmaceutical names up there uh, that have adopted the, the DNA encoded technology. Uh, and um, of course, there's quite a bit of companies that either partner with um, uh, uh, vendors that offer the solution as a service, or um, they actually uh, have their own team where they bring in this technology and they're developing their own kits. Um, what I do want to mention here is that even though um, there's probably an overlap with these technologies, uh, however, it's very important to note that um, even though um, you might have your own internal team that's working on a technology on this technology and developing the chemical molecules for you, um, you can still add the GenScript solution because you would be adding molecules to your uh, screening. Um, to your, uh, to your uh, libraries, uh, so it would be an added benefit or complementary to what you already have. So in, on, in a typical uh, DNA encoded technology, there are two uh, groups of impacting factors. One, of course, is the chemical diversity of the molecules that you're working with, and the second one would be the data analytics. So for the chemical diversity, of course, you want to be working with a suitable library size. And what that means is that you don't want to make the library size very small um, where you're you're um, you're putting a lot of work in and kind of you're going back to having um, the spatial grid se separation. Uh, that's not very effective. Uh, of course, it's very expensive as well. Um, and uh, of course, you don't want to make it too large where the members are competing with one another. So there's articles. Um, um that speak about what is the suitable library size and it's typically 10 to the 6th or 10 to the 9th uh, is really the ideal or the sweet spot also the structural diversity of the chemical molecules uh, you do want to include some linear and some spher spherical core structures uh, and the gendica library the genscript solution is actually based primarily on scaffold structures and then the last component of the chemical diversity is really making sure that you have a good coverage of drug-like candidates. On the other hand, the other bucket is really the data analytics. And so uh, it's not really enough to uh, develop a library and just look at the sequence data of the HIT compounds that you obtain. Um, you really want to have a uh, characterization of the enrichment value. Uh, and this one enable us um, to identify sequencing bias because uh, you don't want to go to your validation uh, step where you're, um, uh, you have a large pool of compounds and you're still trying to parse that on what's a good hit versus what's not a good hit. And then the secondary component of the data analytics is really to look at the structural activity relationship. And this is uh, also uh, very important to remove the false positive hits. And this is something that GenScript can actually um, definitely provide you with. So what are you getting uh, with the GenScript DNA encoded chemical library kit? You're getting an off the shelf kit. It's completely accessible. We are not offering uh, any licensing fees. Uh, it's very affordable, so if that's of interest to you, please do reach out to our team um, and you'll see that um, the kit is, is uh, the, the pricing point is actually very low. It's ready to use, so a single test tube contains uh, over 400 million uh, molecules and the 400 million molecules are actually consisting of 18 uh, chemical sub libraries. Uh, and then the last component that you get with the kit is actually the hit analysis, and it is performed by the people that develop this kit. And that is also included as part of the kit. You do not have to pay an extra fee for that. So basically, um, the way it works is that you order the DNA encoded chemical library kit. You receive a set of four tubes. Uh, I highly recommend that you use one of those tubes uh, as a negative control. Uh, if not, that's up to you, uh, but you can potentially uh, perform four screens. And the first step that you have to do is immobilize your protein of interest. Uh, once you've immobilized it, typically on a magnetic bead with an affinity tag that's specific for your protein, you're going to go ahead and incubate your, your bound uh, protein of interest with the Gendical um, library. Uh, you incubate it. 
And at that point, you end up with um, the bound compounds and you're going to end up washing away the compounds that did not bind. We recommend that you perform this three times. Uh, that way you definitely capture any kind of um, uh, compounds um, that could be uh, potentially a hit, but might have not been bound uh, at the initial screen. After that, you would perform your PCR setup, which is a very standard PCR, uh, and you amplify the um, actual uh, DNA tags that are uh, that would identify your compound. After that, you take your um, DNA tags and you perform your NGS high throughput sequencing. At that point, you share your data with GenScript and our team uh, will actually handle um, the data uh, or the, um, um, the hit screening and we'll share that and we'll prepare a report and share it with you. Again, this that part that component is part of the kit, so there's no extra fee for that. So the next couple slides, I actually included the chemical sub libraries and a few examples of them. So you can see that this particular structure, um, the library, uh, the library size is about seven million compounds, and this is an example of it. Uh, and you can see there's different um, there's different library sizes for each one of the structures um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier we actually uh, I actually listed those in this presentation if you're interested please contact me and I can share additional details with you one thing I want to note is that part of the library is actually a DNA control so if you are concerned with kind of DNA interaction or uh, the chemical linker molecule interaction with your protein of interest our kit the GemDecal kit uh, has uh, had DNA control that would um, accommodate for that. So uh, basically the main structures that you will see in the kit are the linear, the scaffold, and the macrocycle. However, the majority of the kit is actually the scaffold structure. Um, so if you, again, if you have any questions about that, feel free to contact me. Uh, and um, I just want to leave you with that. Uh, this is purposeful. Um, the expert that developed this kit um, actually uh, aim to develop the majority of this kit towards the scaffold structures. Another thing that our team worked on was actually testing or analyzing uh, the chemical structures of the Gendical molecules. So out of those 18 uh, chemical sublibraries, they took 1,000 molecules of each single one for a total of 18,000 molecules, and they laid them out uh, in a uh, and what you see in front of you to, to check for the Lupski's rule of five. Uh, I would imagine everyone that's listening in on, to this talk uh, know or are familiar with the Lupski uh, rule of five, uh, but if you're not, it's basically um, it's basically used as a guide. It's of course an empirical, there are drugs out there that violate this rule, uh, but basically it's a, a drug ability guideline um, to just to basically test if a chemical uh, molecule is a um, has shown uh, activity with your protein of interest, uh, whether or not if it has oral oral viability uh, against um, uh, you know to to make it druggable or and um, permeable for um, uh, the drug um, uh, for your blood burial basically. So what you see in front of you are the chemical and physical properties that are considered within that rule of five. Uh, and what what is what is great to see here is that every single um, component that was identified within that rule of five was actually um, identified as a hit. So the majority of the chemical molecules um, were less than 800 in molecular weight, and the majority of them are actually 550. You can see that this dumbbell shape. Uh, another one is the hydrogen bond acceptor. Again, it was approximately seven. And you can see the majority of them were approximately 15 and less. Another one is the rotational bond. And you can see here the sweet spot was about 10. Uh, and then, of course, the hydrogen um, bond donors and the different different uh, components that you can look at. Another thing that our team developed as well was they laid out the different uh, 18, uh, the, the sub um, the sub libraries against the release version of the drug bank uh, and what they ended up seeing was actually a 98 percent overlap so what that means is that the gendical sub libraries are actually a very good representation 
of the drug uh, bank released version of drugs. So this is this is actually very good to see because that means you have good drug like coverage in the kit. We, our team also conducted another inter internal case study and they tested uh, BRD4. This protein is uh, commonly used. Uh, and what you see in front of you is more of the analytical uh, component that I mentioned earlier that is actually included as part of the Gendical kit. And so uh, what you see in front of you is that the molecules that were identified as a, as a hit uh, using the sequencing data uh, they were laid out on a spatial grid using the enrichment value. So the darker circles um, or the larger circles are an indication of a high enrichment value. And the smaller circles, uh, the ones that are actually uh, orange or yellow, that's an indication of a lower enrichment value. Uh, and of course, the, um, the way that they are sitting on the graph is another indication of the uh, chemical or physical property of these positive hits. So by looking at this, at this um, data, uh, at this analytics, um, there's an intelligence in how we laid out these uh, molecules and it enables us to compare the building blocks of these different molecules. So for example, what you see up here for, gen for the DEL library number two is that at level three enrichment, you see that there's one molecule. I hope you can see my mouse. Uh, there's one molecule in blue uh, that has an adjacent molecule and another adjacent molecule to its left and its to its right uh, that are somewhat uh, at a higher enrichment value. However, uh, it's not a very strong uh, chemical um, structure around it. So that might mean that this particular chemical compound um, might not be a very strong hit. And so it could be that uh, this is a, a chemical compound that you probably don't want to investigate, or it might be that you do, depending on what you are particularly looking for. On the other hand, these orange molecules are fairly random, so there's no uh, structures around them, so chances are those are actually a false positive. So once you've seen this, uh, this analysis, you probably want to remove those from your analysis and you don't want to take it to the next step to the validation component because it becomes very expensive to investigate those molecules when they're not really a, a true uh, positive. However, what you see here, uh, the DNA encoded library number three, uh, this particular uh, screen is actually a perfect example of, a, of a, uh, um, a, an actual positive because you can see that the molecules that were identified as a positive hit uh, are actually sharing a, not only do they have very similar enrichment value, but they also are sitting in a, in a spatial grid that's actually uh, are sharing the same building blocks. So that means that these molecules uh, obviously are interacting with your protein and they are sharing various structures and there's a cluster of them. So this is a very good example of a positive hit. And um, there's a couple other examples here. I'm not gonna go into them for the sake of time, um, but it, it's very important to know uh, that this is, very, this is key in identifying uh, a, a correct hit versus a negative hit, which might be deceiving if you were just looking at the sequence data. So uh, part of this analysis with BRD4, protein BRD4, is that the hit that was identified in this DEL number three was a hit that was identified using our DNA encoded chemical library kit. And uh, I actually found an article uh, by GSK uh, that identified uh, with a BRD4 a compound that they are using um, uh, their own DNA encoded libraries. So uh, the, as you can see, if you compare the hit that was identified by GSK and the hit that was identified by our kit, they're very similar in structure. So this actually is a great example of the success of the GenScript kit. And with that, I'm actually going to open it up to, to questions that you may have. Um, this product is new to GenScript. So uh, I definitely invite you, if you are interested in collaborating with us, to contact me. 
uh, feel free to email me. My email is actually listed up on the slide. Uh, and I thank you for your time today.